Good evening and welcome. My name is Mark Ramagonian. I'm the Director of Academic Affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser. And on behalf of Nasser and the co-sponsoring organization of tonight's program, Project Save Armenian Photograph Archives, I thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us to watch and to talk about the documentary Photos by Kirk. And it's been uh, a little more than a year now uh, since the pandemic caused us to, to shut down our new building, which is actually where I am now and where Ruth Tomasian is now in a safely uh, secluded separate room. Uh, and it's been, you know, kind of a terrible year by most objective measures. Uh, but uh, it's been almost a year now since we started our online programming. And one of the highlights for us of this otherwise miserable year has been the opportunity to reach people who might otherwise never had a chance to attend a NASA event. So we thank the hundreds, in fact, the thousands of people who have watched over the past year on Zoom and on YouTube. And as the song says, we'll meet again. So uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. As you see, we have a wonderful group of friends with us, filmmaker Jamie Day Fleck, Ruth Tomasian from Project Save, and Savag Yogoyan from the Pomegranate Film Festival. And we will be hearing from all of them after the movie. Now, in my no longer able to keep track of time mind, it was just a couple of years ago that Jamie contacted me and then came to the old Nasser building to shoot a segment of her documentary, Photos by Kirk. In reality, it was closer to 10 years ago than, than to today. Uh, but again, who can tell anymore what time is? Uh, but I thought then, and I think now that it was a great project that she was engaged in, and we were very pleased to have the chance to bring it uh, to an audience, an Armenian audience tonight, along with Project Save. So again, following the screening of Photos by Kirk, which is 26 minutes long, we will hear from its producer, editor, and director, Jamie Day Fleck, as well as from Ruth Tomasian, the founder of Project Save, Armenian Photograph Archives, and who is also featured in the film, by the way, and who knows a little bit about photography, I believe. <laughs> and Sevag Yagoyan, the founder of the Pomegranate Film Festival in Toronto. And then we'll have a discussion and take questions from the audience. Uh, after the film, please use the Zoom Q&A to submit questions. And we will see you after the film. Enjoy. All right, and we're back. Uh, I really enjoyed watching that again. And uh, it's a very moving moving story and 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 i just love the fact that we got to know this this person and his work that otherwise i would have never even heard of so i'd like to now invite uh jamie to tell us about the, the project from her perspective and how she got involved in with mr kirk in the first place jamie thanks mark yeah so um a lot of people ask me that question so mimi was a family friend and uh, i did my undergraduate degree at parsons in new york city and when I lived there, I would often go by and chat with her. So while I was on the program, um, she uh, mentioned her father was a photographer and got me to print some of the glass negatives that he had, or that she had of his, uh, while in the dark rooms uh, at Parsons. So I did that for her. And then almost 10 years later, uh, the idea kind of still was floating around in my head and I entered a master's program in documentary media in Toronto at Ryerson University. And I decided to do that as my thesis project. So that's how the film started. I didn't really know about all his Armenian background particularly or the genocide, uh, I just, liked Mimi, I liked the New York story. So maybe that's why I also start the film from that perspective, but it was wonderful to dive in and really learn uh, all that I did about Armenian culture while I was producing the film. And, and in, in the process of, of doing that, um, I mean, did you, do you feel like you came to uh, an understanding of, of who Kirk was and what made him tick? Um, that's kind of hard to say actually, because, you know, I was piecing together a person from 
people's recollections of him and uh, Mimi's obviously her relationship, which was sort of remote, even though um, she was his daughter. So it, I don't know if I got a true feeling of who, who he was, but I, you know, there were different facets that I was able to show. And when I approached the story, I didn't want to do it from a victim kind of perspective. I wanted to do it from a survivor perspective, somebody that had gone on to do all this wonderful work and, and be a real sort of leader in his community versus doing it from, oh, this happened to him in the past. So that's why I kind of put that at the end instead of putting it at the beginning, even though it's sort of his life story to some degree. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and I mean, he seemed to really take pride in, it said in the movie, in his in his work and in the place he held in, in the community. And that, you know, I, I think this is probably common for a lot of genocide survivors that when they were able to, if they were able to, fortunately, to uh, achieve a level of, of success and respect and security in their new new residence, place of residence, that, that must have been something that they clung to very tightly. Yes, I definitely got that feeling. Yeah. And also, you know, New York in general, because there, that immigrant story is so uh, prevalent in New York City. You know, there were probably people coming from after World War II coming to New York. And so I'm sure that that was sort of in the <laughs> general feel of their, their community. Ruth Tomasian. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you've, you've spent more time uh, pondering uh, our Armenian photographs and photographers than I dare say almost anybody uh, on, on the planet. Uh, <laughs> Now tell me, how many, how many Kirk photos were you familiar with before uh, you met Jamie? Yeah, well, first, let me first thank you, Mark, for hosting this and for Jamie for doing the film, because mm -hmm. as your question leads me to an answer, I hadn't heard of Mr. Kirk until Jamie appeared at our doorstep and I did my research, Mark. It was in 2013. Yeah. Yeah. And she had her baby, her months old baby in a stroller. When she came to do her research, we blessed her and the baby and said, good for you. Thank you so much for doing this film. And when I look at her film, it gives me goosebumps because I see as a young man, Kirk was, uh, Kurkin Hosefian was this beautiful soul. I mean, you look at his face and all you see is the beauty of his soul. And, and I'm sure he had to shut down what he had, what his eyes had observed, the emotions that went through him during the genocide. I can't imagine him seeing all that death and destruction and having a, a, an emotionally well life. And I know now as a senior, as I look back on my life, and it is wonderful to live long enough to look back on the decades of your life. But when he was that age, it looks like he was overcome with the grief of it. And it really just changed him into a very sad person. And you can understand why um, the, the, the whole emotional, health of it, um, his survival had caught up with him. But but his photographs are so emotional. He, he gets the emotion out of people. He knows how to pull it out of people. That's to me what's so amazing. And I wish we had, photo we don't have one photograph of, by, by Kurkin Hosepian. Uh, we have a few photo donors from the Bronx and I look, did look through their, their files of photos and they, Back in the day, um, it, it, I started Project Save in 1975. So in the first maybe 10 years or so, we were really concentrating on homeland photographs as opposed to photographs taken here in this country. Now we collect everything and we're very interested in, in photographs wherever people have lived, uh, after the homeland, wherever, but we have none. So we'd love to have some photographs that represent uh, 
Kurkin. Um, but I just wanted to ask Ruth, you do have some photos of his cousin uh, Malikian. Well, yes, because I, I did go to Worcester and I spent a lot of time collecting and documenting photographs in Worcester. And by that time, that was in like 1984-ish, um, I was interested in documenting Armenian photographers. So we, KS, he was Khazar Malikian, Mary's father, but we all knew him as KS Malikian. He was from Harpert and he photographed everybody in Worcester. I mean, everybody went to KS Malikian. So we do have Malikian photographs at Project Six, yes. But no, no mention, I, I never heard um, anyone mention Korkin until you came along. So thank you, thank you for that, <laughs> really. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Sevag, you arranged one of the first showings of, uh, of uh, photos by Kirk at, at the, Pome was it at the Pomegranate uh, Festival this year or last year? Actually in 2015, Mark. Oh, was um, it, that? oh, excuse me. Oh, no problem. And there's an interesting story to it. So before the festival, we were getting ready for the festival that year. And of course, it was the uh, centennial commemoration of the genocide. And we had a group from Montreal who visited us. There was the Hamaskayim Board of Directors from Montreal. And they, for years, have been talking about, why don't we have a film festival? Can we sort of export the Pomegranate Film Festival to Montreal? And as a preview, we showed that board, this film, by Jamie. Jamie came and spoke about the film. They were so moved by it, but it took five years. But in 2020, just before the pandemic, we had the first ever Montreal Pomegranate Film Festival, which Jamie essentially kickstarted by showing her beautiful short piece. So thank you, Jamie, for doing that. And thank you for bringing the story to life. And, and just to add to what Ruth is saying, it, it's amazing. And by the way, thank you to Nasser for all the wonderful work you do in bringing these, these stories to the diaspora. So thank you, Mark. And thank you, Ruth, for all the work you've done since 1975. Now, in terms of um, Kirk, I, as Ruth, had never heard of Kurken Hofsepi until I saw the film. But one of the things that moved me was this history of talented Armenian pho photographers, uh, Yusuf Karch and Ara Gulur and uh, all sorts of them over the years that have just really um, arvestus to Lomali. They just, they're, they're remarkable in their trade and what they brought to life. And for example, Maryam Shahinian, the first uh, female photographer in Turkey was Armenian and um, and many others. I, I'm missing some here, Vahan Kochad and uh, Pascal Sebal. And in fact, the Turkish Ottoman uh, personal royal photographers were Armenians dating back to the 1860s. So we've always had this ability, it seems, as, as wonderful photographers in, in different spheres of the arts, but particularly in photography. And it's amazing to see uh, the wonderful work that, that Kirk did and sort of how he, in a way, chronicled his community. Um, and it wasn't just the Armenian community, it was the entire community, whether you were of a Jewish background or Italian background, what have you, he was the neighborhood photographer and he brought their story to life. And as you can see, photography. We, we, we lost a couple of words there, Sevak, at the end, but. Uh... I'm sorry, the, the... I was just saying that uh, this community was brought to life and chronicled by by Kirk, mm -hmm. Mr. Kirk. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that the the story, uh, the the segment in in the film with the the son of the rabbi is really, really wonderful because uh, you know again these photographs have this power uh, to bring people <laughs> to bring people back who are no longer with us uh, and. and places that maybe no longer exist. Uh, and, and certainly for uh, for Armenians in particular, maybe it's very poignant. Uh, with Ruth talked about initially concentrating on photos of, uh, of the old country, uh, which, you know, in a very literal way, it, are places that don't exist anymore. But now uh, with more than a century, well over a century of Armenian American life uh there, there's an incredible tradition of armenian uh, american and canadian uh, armenian photographers uh as well as, as you mentioned um karsh and, and garo and uh and, and so many uh it, it's it's a really rich tradition uh ruth what can you tell us about how it came to be 
that Armenians were so prominent in in photography? Well, a lot of it had to do with their artistic tendencies and the cultural sort of prohibition of a man being able to support his family as an artist. So that was, to be an artist was discouraged. But when photography came along, you could be the artist and be a photographer. And, and this is where the eye, the eye of the photographer comes in, the artist's eye behind the lens of the camera. And that's, I believe, how it started. Um, the early photographers in Harpert and we've all where where Kirk was born, um, we, we've always focused our attention on photographers because without them, we would have no photographs. So the Sasurian Frere, they were artists and you could see their artistry in the backdrops that they literally hand painted and they would nail them up on the side of the house where they had gone to photograph the family. And you would see the, um, the weeping willow tree in the background. And we always knew that was a Sasurian photograph. So they expressed their artistry in fascinating ways and they were able to make money and support their families. So the, the, the tradition of being photographers passed on from generation to generation and, and to other people who saw that it was a worthwhile occupation, for, especially if you had that artist's eye. It was very important. I should mention again that uh, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, submit them using the Zoom Q&A. Uh, Jamie, question about the availability of the film. Uh, after this, as hopefully many people who are watching will uh, want to see the film again sometime or tell their friends about it, how and when do you think they will be able to view the film? Well, the film is available through my website, so it's uh, fleckpro.com and you can just purchase it there and download it immediately. Great. So we should note, Mark, Jamie has another wonderful film about an Armenian artist called The Voice of the Violin, which is also available on our website. We actually presented that at the Pomegranate Film Festival in 2016. She's got other wonderful films too, but those are two that really stood out that we presented in Toronto. Please tell us about that one. Yeah, that was very, it was very co odd coincidence that the next short film I did uh, my husband uh, was friends with a violin maker here in Toronto, and he has several of his instruments, and he just happened to be Armenian. So we shot that, and it's actually, he felt better doing his interview in Armenian than doing it in English. So we even have a good bulk of the film in Armenian with subtitles. You call it a coincidence. I call it a pattern. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> Could be another one coming. We have to give Jamie an Armenian name. Yes, I'll be honorary Armenian name. That'd be great. Right. Oh, our committee calls her Flekian. It's all right. <laughs> I love it. It's like Kavuk, I guess, Kavukian. Yeah. Here in Toronto. Yeah, and Karsh, you know, all these, uh, Karsh specifically was uh, very uh, impressed upon me as a photographer. My stepfather, who mentored me, is a is a portrait photographer and that classical style that Karsh did, he was very inspired by. So it's, um, it, obviously this was all seeping in. I wanna say one thing, if you don't mind, Mark, about that uh, that uh, Jewish uh, story with Yitz Twersky. It was amazing how I met Yitz. Um, he, so around the time that I was at school at Parsons, a woman named Constance Rosenblum, who's in the film, the author was writing a book on the Bronx concourse. And she is uh, a writer, uh, I guess the editor for the city section of the New York Times. So she wrote a full article on Kirk in uh, the New York Times city section. And then people started sending letters into her saying, oh, I remember him. Oh, he took my photos. How's Mimi doing? I went to school with her, all these different letters. And then when I started the film, Mimi handed this folder of letters to me. And Yitz was in there and he spoke so passionately and with such a vivid memory about these photos. And so I just found him online and uh, he agreed to be in the film and spoke so warmly. It was an amazing experience. Yeah, that was wonderful. I love the music. <laughs> I think you can, um, 
produce the music and really get people moving. It's wonderful. Your your musicians did a fabulous job. Excellent. Well, that was a, a difficult thing. I don't know if I need to go in the behind the scenes of that, but Please. um we I that was a band here in Toronto that I heard on the radio. They're they were called Club Django Sextet. And they play Django Reinhardt music and uh, Stefan Grappelli music. And so I connected. They play at local pubs and things here. And they, they let me use music from their CD. But we found out that I was going to have extreme difficulty licensing Django Reinhardt's music. Uh, even tracking down the people that actually license it was very difficult. So I ended up just getting them to re-record it. <laughs> And so they recorded their own improvisations of the pieces, not based off of Django Reinhardt, but just their own compositions. And that's how we came up with that music. And then the Armenian music is from a gentleman in LA, which was great, an Armenian there. I don't Perfect. know. Um, and yeah, so, and then I did wanna say one other thing someone had asked, to, not asked, but mentioned about Mark, Ruth, Adam, who had, summarized the Armenian genocide. That was a very difficult um, part of the film for me to edit. I didn't, I wanted to include enough information that people could get a grasp of what that meant because being non-Armenian, I had no, before starting the film, I really didn't know anything about the Armenian genocide. So I really wanted to bring it to a non-Armenian audience and not, uh, go over their heads, but really speak, tell them what it was in simple enough terms so that they could look it up and get interested in it. And um, I, there was another gentleman, Dr. Alan Whitehorn is actually here tonight. I interviewed him. He was very, very helpful. But unfortunately, I didn't want to go off too much from Kirk's story to go into all the historical details of what happened. So I had to give enough that it contextualized the film, but not go off into, into everything. Though I did have to write, I think, a 50-page paper, which I also talk about, obviously, the genocide in more depth mm -hmm. in the paper. So it was unfortunate that Dr. Whitehard couldn't end up in the film, but there, we had a lot of great people. Well, and you did a wonderful job, um, especially adding the audio tape with mm. Korken's voice that told the audience a lot about the genocide i mean you could because you could feel it feel yeah. it in your feet feel it in your heart yeah that was a wonderful find so just in the article that constance rosenblum wrote she mentioned something about him talking about his experiences and i said to mimi how did she hear him talk? Because he had been obviously gone for many years by that point. And she said, oh, and she opened her desk drawer and pulled out this cassette tape. And she said, we did this recording of him in his 70s or whatever and, wow. and here. And she had never even thought to give it to me as a documentary filmmaker. I thought it was so funny. So, and of course I took it like it was gold and <laughs> went and digitized it for her. And um, now we have that, but. Yeah, it was amazing to have him talking in his own voice about his experiences. That was done by Mimi's husband, who actually just recently passed away about a, two years ago, a year or two ago, and um, who's in the film. And so he, he did the interview for that. And it was amazing, the clarity and the way that he spoke that was very late in his life. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we have a question here that I'm sure a lot of people wonder about, and that is, uh, where are uh, Kirk's photographs stored, and do they have a curator, or is that function performed by his daughter still? I wish I had a good answer to this. <laughs> Mimi still has his photographs. After I finished the film, I put them in a good state. They were not exactly well being well preserved. They were being held, she obviously had the foresight to keep them for the 30 plus years since his death. So that was very good on her part, but they weren't in any kind of vault or any kind of special uh, way. They were in a box actually when I got them. And so I put them into binders and sleeves and then 
return them to her. And there's actually a small collection of glass negatives as well. So I assume she still has them. And they will either go to her children or me, maybe, or archive. I'm not totally sure what she has thought for that. One vote here for an archive. Uh, yeah, so of course. <laughs> that. <laughs> available of course. And, and accessible to, to people in the future. It's unfortunate uh, not to get on this particular soapbox that I'm often on that so much of Armenian American history uh, and culture has not been always preserved. Uh, a lot has been lost, but a lot has been saved. Thank you, Ruth Tomasian. Thank you to so many other people at other institutions who have done a lot of work to make sure a lot gets saved. But uh, unfortunately, Armenian American things are not necessarily treated with the same reverence that old country things are, are treated. Uh, and, and I hope I shall live long enough to see that change uh, because you know, we Armenians have been in North America for, you know, pretty close to a century and a half, and there's a lot of material and it needs to be preserved and studied and presented to people. So thank you for doing what you did in this film and to Ruth and, and to Sevak as well for doing all, all that you do. Uh, I have another question here. Um, did he take pictures of his uh, family daily events? Was he, you know, did he take household pictures or was he not a hobbyist as a photographer, but a, strictly a professional? As I recall, there were photographs of maybe Christmas Day or, um, or family members, the Armenian community in New York, uh, there were some photos of that. Friends, obviously, in Massachusetts when he was learning. There were a few. I wouldn't say it was probably a great uh, volume because, like Mimi says, he was sort of disconnected as a father. Though I know that he did photograph his grandchildren, but I think it was more of a portrait style versus uh, just out and about kind of look. He might not have done well in the selfie era, in other words. Yeah, <laughs> not really his thing. Um, there's a question here from one audience member uh, looking at uh, her parents' wedding album and wondering if if Mr. Kirk could have been the photographer. Did he la Are his photos uh, labeled with his name? That would be for Jamie to answer. Yeah. So I recall, um, no, I don't remember. They might have been stamped on the back. I would check the back of the prints because oftentimes photographers, if it's stuck in an album, it may be difficult. Usually an album would have had some kind of indication who the studio was. If it's uh, on the back page or maybe somewhere, there probably was a stamp or something. Uh, as far as Kirk's photos being similar, um, there were a lot of photographers that shot in a very similar style. So um, that is, um, it could have been him, but it could have been a lot of people. That sort of classic background look was pretty popular back then. Were there other Armenian photographers working in, in the Bronx uh, at the same time uh, as he was? Did, were his, who, who was his competition in that uh, neighborhood? Do you know? No, I, I don't know who the other local photographers were. How about you, Ruth? Do you have any other Bronx uh, Armenian photographers? Of that era, uh, no, no. Um... You know, I'm trying to even think of New York photographers, you know, in the 30s and 40s. And uh, I really have to rack my brain on that one. Interesting. It's a good question. I'll look it up at tomorrow when I get to the office. Get on that. <laughs> we do cross-reference by place. And so um, if we have something taken in uh, the Bronx, we put it in the Bronx file. Or by Kurkin or Kirk, we put it in Kirk's file. But so there's cross-referencing going on and uh, I may find something, I hope. 
But we do find it important to, um, we're all about the continuation of life. We, we have not gotten stuck in the homeland. We, we consider it very important to document how our lives have continued from wherever places in the diaspora we live. And it's important to see that we intermingle with, with other people where we live and take photographs of other people. We just don't only take photographs of Armenian people. We want everybody to you know, be our customers. Well, Jamie, there's one question or comment here uh, asking if you would consider sharing your second film on the uh, viol violin maker uh, uh, with us as you did this one. So we can we can talk about that uh, uh, offline and, and who knows, we may be able to make that happen in, in, in the future. Um, that would be great. The one thing to note is that is a shorter film. It's 15 minutes. So just for programming. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I recommend it. Very good. Yeah, that would be wonderful to hear. To see. All right, let me just make sure I've got everything here uh, set up. Um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, our panelists if they have any uh, last words um, before we, we sign off. Sebag. Questions from uh, Professor Whitehorn had a question about. Oh. Uh, you'll see it there about similarities. Okay. Yes, uh, the origins. Now we know that the, the Karsh brothers, they were both from uh, Mardin and they emigrated uh, with their parents and eventually became world class photographers in the Ottawa area, Canada's capital. There was another famous photographer who was born in Erzurum and he, um, is after the Hamidian massacres, he escaped with his father to Egypt and became a very well known photographer in Egypt known as Armand. And in fact, his son continued uh, under the same name. So there's been quite a few Armenian photographers that were born uh, uh, prior to 1915 or in around 1915 that went on to great things throughout the diaspora. Just to answer Dr. Whitehorn's question. Um, thank you. Ruth? Oh, I'd just love to encourage everybody to preserve their photographs. Please write names and dates and places and who the photographer was on the backside. Even if it was your mom or dad, I always ask, so who had the camera to take this snapshot? Because it's the eye of the photographer tells you how the photograph was set up. I mean, um, and if you, some pictures you'll see people and the little kids, they're looking at this photographer and they're scared because he's behind this big, camera with a black cloth but you don't know that when you see them but if you know who took the photograph then hey if it's the mother maybe they're not scared or things like that it's important to know who the photographer was and to give them credit for their good work right preserving our history definitely it's interesting i had a personal story about that my um my grandmother was getting rid of things from her house and she wanted to get rid of this box of slides. And my father took it and kept it for over 10 years. And then she passed away two years ago and he gave me this box just a few months ago to scan almost a thousand slides. And wow. most of them are photos of her <laughs> and of the family. And it's just, it's amazing to have that archive which could have easily been trashed. And I think a lot of local photographers, the, they pass away and then the family doesn't know what to do with these negatives, at least in the past. Now, obviously it's more digital, but they don't know what to do with these archives. And it's, it's good that Kirk has somewhere to go. People care about, I'm sure there are people that do care about the archives, but often families, they don't know what to do with it. They think, oh, we'll give it to a museum and the museums don't want them. So it's, it's kind of a challenge for them. Project Save does want them. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, anyone out there, if you have photographs and you don't know what to do with them, please talk to Ruth Tomasian and our friends. And, this, and our staff at Project Save, yes. And I really want to thank uh, Mark and for having me tonight. Uh, I've been wanting to show this film to the community at NASAR, and it's been wonderful. Thank you so much.
Jamie, thank you. And Sevag and Ruth as well. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Uh, it's a wonderful film. So please, if you enjoyed it as much as I did, uh, check out Jamie's website and uh, tell your friends to watch it. And I think they will be as moved by it as, uh, as, as we are. So thank you. Uh, Jamie will be talking, Sevag will be talking, and Ruth and everyone else, see you next time. Thank you for spending the evening with us. Bye. It's been great. Thanks. Thank you.